Um, might start. So hello and welcome everyone back to the next session of the TADWIG 2021 virtual conference. My name is Ellie Wallace and I work at the Atlas of Living Australia. I'm also the Deputy Chair of TADWIG. I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, Australia on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people and I pay my respects to them and my respects to any First Nations people joining us today from around the world. If you need any tech support during the session, as you will have found out by now, hopefully, we're being very well helped by Avery and the team at, uh, at Florida, uh, and they have been attending to issues with Zoom um, or Hoover dropping out very promptly, which seems to be the main tech problem that we're finding. The session is being recorded for later viewing, uh, and the videos are going up very promptly uh, <laughs> so that you can catch up with the conference uh, sessions if time zones or other commitments mean that you can't watch live. So please ask questions of the speakers uh, using the Q&A function in Hoover. We've noticed quite a few people putting, uh, putting questions into the chat function straight in Zoom. Um, that will uh, give our co-moderator, co uh, Kate, a little bit of a challenge to try and uh, balance those two out. So it's easiest if you can put the questions into the Q&A function in Hoover. You're also very welcome to use the chat function in Hoover as well, uh, but do be aware that we may miss questions if you post them in there. And just a reminder of the code of conduct, um, so everybody uh, should abide by that code and make sure that the, um, that the chat is respectful in nature. So without further ado, we have four uh, speakers for our session today. And uh, so I'm going to hand straight over so that um, we will run till about quarter after the next hour. And uh, we'll have some time for both discussion and um, questions at the end of each, uh, each talk. So I would like now to hand over to Dave Viglase, who is going to speak to us first on the topic of the Internet of Samples and giving us a progress report. Dave, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ellie, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining in. Um, so iSamples, or the Internet of Samples, is a standards-based um, collaboration to uniquely, consistently, and conveniently, and this is the important part, identify material samples, record core metadata about them, and link them to other samples, data, and research products. Uh, so this is a topic that's very familiar, I'm sure, to um, pretty much everybody in Tadwig as far as being able to uh, gather information about specimens or samples and relate them to each other and discover them and so forth. Uh, the project sponsored by NSF, it started last year. Uh, it's going to keep running through 2024 or thereabouts. And we have several um, institutional level participants, uh, University of Kansas, Columbia, uh, University of Arizona, California, Smithsonian Institution, Open Context, and USGS. And these institutions all bring different um, domains of expertise to the project. Our basic goals are to facilitate material sample discovery. And by material samples, we're really referring to items that have been sampled from the natural world, pretty much and their derivative products. So that includes mineral samples, archeological samples, um, biological specimens. So there is a fair bit of overlap with the activity in Tadwig or the Tadwig domain, uh, but it also expands well beyond um, the typical domain of Tadwig. Um, our goals are really to um, you know, facilitate discovery, but also ensure um, reliable and easy access to the data and to, and a super important part of all this is to make it all sustainable so that um, it's a very low cost outcome and it should be easily, relatively easy to maintain into the future. And we hope to, through by way of um, uh, uh, feedback to even the field, people collecting samples in the field to provide mechanisms to make it easier to provide quality metadata at the point of collection so and follow that metadata all the way through the lifespan of the samples. Um, so we have four uh, participating collections uh, to start off with. 
That includes CSAR, the System for Earth Sample Registration, Open Context, which provides archaeological records, the Smithsonian Institute, which has a huge diversity of uh, information, uh, physical samples, and GEOM, the Genomics, um, um, Genomic Observations Metadata Database. To start with, there's about 6 million records um, across the gamut there. Uh, there's very diverse implementations of systems that serve this information. There's diverse sets of identifiers, mostly ARC identifiers and IGSN, the International Geosamples Number identifiers. Uh, but uh, the infrastructure we're building is uh, completely agnostic with respect to identifiers. Oops. The approach is pretty simple, um, conceptually at least. It's fairly straightforward. Um, starting from the left, uh, you know, we collect samples from the field. Uh, they're typically held in a repository. And the goal of iSamples is to really simplify the sharing of that information. And there's two key pieces to this. Uh, one is a, a very simple common model that is able to describe key properties of any physical sample. And then there's the software component, which is providing transformations from whatever format or schema the original content is expressed in into this simplified um, representation so that it's relatively easy to collect that information, index it, make it discoverable, and most importantly, relate back to the original samples and to any derived products from there. The system itself um, is fairly simple um, internally, um, but there are a lot of external interactions. And it's important that, uh, for our samples that to provide fairly robust in, um, interactions with these external uh, resources, such as, uh, you know, obviously the collections are one external resource for the iSample system, but also ontologies, including controlled vocabularies and, and community maintained standards. Uh, there's identifier authorities that uh, are useful for resolving identifiers, but also to facilitate uh, minting of identifiers to assist with uh, early identification of physical samples in the field. Identity systems like Walkerd and others to assist with uh, identification of people and organizations and so forth. And then of course, publishers. Uh, we wanna be able to follow from publications all the way and we work backwards all the way to the, to identify the samples that contributed to the, you know, the analyses and so forth for those publications. The architecture of the system, um, it's, this is obviously a very high level, uh, schematic, um, but the, the, a couple of key pieces. Um, there's two main software components that and we call one iSamples in a box, the other iSamples central. iSamples in a box is really a uh, containerized system that runs in Docker or can be installed separately that uh, kind of attaches to the collection and provides the translation services for an external facing APIs. It uh, provides a translation into the core model. Um, and iSample Central is really a, a mechanism. It's kind of like GBIF in a way, except a much smaller version of it. It collates information from iSamples in a box that, and, and provides discovery interfaces. And all this information is accessible through APIs um, so that uh, researchers and others, other systems can ingest this information in a fairly seamless way. We're, we're using JSON-LD to represent the content um, and everything is automated and synchronized so that uh, as new content is added to collections or content in collections changes, uh, the information flows through the entire system. Um, core model, it's, it's an interesting exercise developing this core model because it's really comes down to, well, Besides many other things, my important aspect is balancing too much information that we're trying to capture versus too little. The core model is really targeted towards promoting discovery. And so there's some key, asp key properties of that, which includes obviously identifiers, but also spatial and temporal information, 
associated with events that led to the samples um, and any um, related entities and so forth. Oh, and another important piece is the type of material that's physical sample represents. An important part of this mapping is uh, uh, or mapping from the original source records to the um, core model is term mapping. And this is in many cases, um, we have uh, terms such as material type, which is a fairly controlled vocabulary in I samples. And we need to map from the original term to the, um, the controlled term. And you can imagine doing this for millions of records gets a bit challenging. Yeah, for a lot of them, we're able to do simple lookup tables. So it's automated once we set that up. But for others, there's a lot of free text descriptions of specimens that need to be now analyzed and used. And so we took a simple machine learning approach and adopted fast text algorithm to do this. And um, with only a fairly small um, randomized sample for testing and evaluation and training, uh, we're able to get up to 90%, 92% precision recall fairly quickly. Um, so now the term mapping is all completely automated as new content comes in the collection, we're able to map it through the, to the um, core model fairly easily. Um, the synchronization component is fairly straightforward. It's very simple. Uh, we're using JSON-LD, as I mentioned, to represent the records. Uh, we're using sitemaps, very low, um, very simple technology for, for representing for, or for advertising the availability of the JSON-LD as well as when it changes. And we are also evaluating other mechanisms like SQLite as a way to encompass um, a representation of the data sets and also spatial tiles feeding into things like Google Earth and Cesium and other sort of spatial rendering systems um, very efficiently. An important part of all this is all this content is relatively static. So it's, we can very easily leverage these global CDNs for very robust, reliable distribution of the information. And through the, uh, through the automated synchronization process, everything flows through fairly efficiently and easily with very little human intervention. Current status is that we've got a bunch of stuff working. The next big challenge is working on uh, or fin filling, finishing off the related materials pieces. Uh, that's the relatively challenging aspect to deal with across the different domains because of the a slightly well nuanced conceptual differences between say samples and subsamples and so forth. Um, and that's about it for a quick overview of the iSamples project. Uh, if you want to, if you want inf more information about iSamples, reach out to me uh, or any of the other authors of this um, um, talk. I'd also point out the Sampling Nature uh, Research Coordination Network, which is dealing with a sort of broader aspect of um, defining core models or models for representing um, physical samples and contact Sarah Ramdeen for more information about that. Um, thank you. I did go a little bit over time, I apologize. Thanks, Dave, that was great. Um, I, I really like your comment about balancing, balancing too much versus too little information. Uh, it's always very easy to go down those rabbit holes of, oh, and we, and we might need this, we might need this, we might need this, um, and then finding You've got a standard where half the terms don't ever get filled because people didn't actually really need it. Uh, we do have one qu one question, and just while we're swapping screen sharing, I'll um, just ask uh, this one question, uh, which is: Is the sampling model aligned with the ISO OGC observations and measurements standard? <clears throat> um, yes and no. Um, so it is somewhat. We're taking a, 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 an approach of um, gathering, uh, working from um, well-defined standard models to start with, um, but uh, we're iterating a lot over the, the implementation of the model or the scheme of the model um, to really get down to what is effective for the, for the source materials as far as discovery is concerned. And so basically what we're doing is we're doing the mappings, populating search index, evaluating discovery across all the millions of samples, and then sort of 
going back and changing the model a little bit more and so forth. And so it's, it's we're, we're, we're reusing terms and concepts as far as possible from um, standard representations. That's great, excellent. Um, thank you very much. Uh, there'll be hopefully time for a little bit more discussion um, afterwards. James has just put in a comment to say, thanks, Dave, more of a comment, but it is important to note that a TADWIG working group is in flight working on material sample definition and its alignment with related terms. So lots of activity. Uh, so yeah. now can I, hand, <laughs> um, can I hand over to Javier? Javier, would you like to start sharing your screen? Javier is from the Atlas of sure. Living Australia and will be talking about implementing GBIF pipelines in the Atlas of Living Australia and the collaboration that's been uh, done, I think I can say, the collaboration that we have, have been working on over the last uh, year and a half. Javier, over to you. Thanks, Ali. Uh, now, can you see the screen? Yes, that's great. Fantastic, let me get started. Okay, interdependent people combine their own efforts with the efforts of others to achieve great, their greatest success. And hi to all the participants that join us today from across the globe. My name is Javier Molina. I'm a project manager on the Atlas of Living in Australia, ALA for short. And today I will tell you the story of how the, in the ALA, with the help of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, JVIF, and the Living Analysis Coordinator deliver a project called Core Infrastructure Upgrade and the benefits of such collaboration. This is the agenda we will be covering. So let's begin. The ALA is a biodiversity data aggregator and JV Australian node. The ALA provides services for scientists, policymakers, industry, and the general public. Our focus for this session is around the species occurrence record system and their dependencies. This is a very high level depiction of the process to ingest occurrence records. An occurrence describes what species is being recorded at what location and when. Our data model is based on the Darwin Core standard. Think. Occurrence records are contained in data collections. The ingestion system will process the records containing a data collection performing the following operations. Validation, such as unique identifiers, data transformation and enrichment, such as adding taxonomy information for the supply of species and quality checks, also known as assertions or issues. For example, records are flagged if the provided coordinates don't match the boundary for the provided country. After processing the ingestion systems, it stores the occurrence record in a search index. The Occurrence Web Services API will use the search index to query, download, and access occurrence records. Those web services are the engine that behind the scenes power applications that you are more familiar with, such as the special portal, the ALA Occurrence Search Portal BioCache, and the Gala R package, to name a few. And this brings us to the point I wanted to discuss today. Our occurrence record ingestion system known as BioCache Store was holding us back. It was one of our oldest systems that we have been running for over 10 years and it became difficult to maintain. New features or fixes were difficult to test as it required a complex setup. Troubleshooting production issues was not e easier. It became slow for the demand that we had. It processed data collection sequentially. In addition, our occurrence web services and search index didn't cope with heavy loads. So we knew we needed to do something. Upgrading our current system was not an option. Starting from scratch was a possibility, but it would take a fair effort to get there. Instead of reinventing the wheel, there was another option. Adopt the GBIF pipeline system that GBIF have been running for a few years now. We have had previous conversations for collaboration with the GBIF team, so this seemed like the best way forward. And with that in mind, we started the journey of the core infrastructure upgrade project on April last year. The goal we set for the project addressed the pain points we had had with the old system, as well as taking advantage of collaboration with GBIF. And these uh, take us to what we did. But let's start by describing what the GBIF pipeline is. It is a consistent data processing framework for parsing, interpretation, and quality flagging. It can run in a laptop, a server, or a cluster. It is an open source platform that uses Apache Beam for defining and executing workflows 
and Apache Avro as the structured data format for processing. We both JBIP and ALA use Apache Spark as runtime environment, but as opposed to JBIP, we use Apache Solar as the final storage and search index. What we did was use out of the box functionality and then we extended it to cater for ALA specific needs, such as the processing of ALA taxonomy or ingestion of images very specific to our setup. The diagram lists in orange all the stages known as transforms that we added. The JV pipelines itself allow us to orchestrate all the different steps. Similar to our previous system, our data pipelines starts with the ingestion of a data collection as a Darwin Core archive. And after processing, that data collection is added to the solar index to make it available for consumption. Originally, we started work in our pipelines implementation using JV pipelines as a library. But soon in our regular catch-ups with the JBIF team, we were suggested to integrate our work as part of the main JBIF pipelines code repository. So we worked together to restructure the code, separating common functions from JBIF and ALA specific ex extensions. We contributed to the to common functions as, such as date processing. We were also fortunate to work with the Living Atlas's coordinator who contributed a common line interface and Debian deployment package for the project. Beyond the GBIF pipelines adoption, additional work was required for an end-to-end -end integration. A few highlights are, we improved our occurrence record web services to be more responsive. We developed a translation service for assertions and fields to keep compatibility with clients. We updated Solar Cloud from version six to eight and tuned it to further improve performance and stability. We dockerized sensitive data and taxonomy libraries into services. Previously, we only had embedded libraries for them. We reviewed and updated documentation for all assertions. And for our image service, we added functionality to allow a synchronous image loading and migrated images storage to AWS S3. We performed a data cleansing and migration of all our occurrence records from the old system. Overall, we commissioned 30 new servers to replace the old ingestion system. And all that work takes us to this. The project went live at the end of June this year, materializing the following benefits. The new system eliminated potential sources of confusion by using a consistent flags and interpretations. While I'm not expecting you to read the contents of the screenshot, what I want to highlight is that the same data quality checks and interpretations are run by both GBIP and ALA. As described earlier, we paid particular attention to fine-tuned solar and biocache service to improve performance and stability. The new virtual infrastructure when released was 33% cheaper than the one used in the old system. This is a significant save for us as it is our largest system. It is difficult to quantify the run, uh, sorry, the, the savings on running a more stable system. Our DevOps team can focus on project work as opposed to troubleshooting. Soon after the project release, the eBear dataset consisting of more than 20 million records was ingested. This was a challenge in the past and a good reason we waited until the pipelines release. The collaboration not only benefits GBIP or the ALA, but the community more broadly, which brings me to the next point. Looking into the future, there is already work underway by the Living Atlas's coordinator to integrate the GBIP pipelines as a deployment option for the Living Atlas's toolkit. We also recognize the collaboration for the GBIP pipelines is not a one-off, but an ongoing commitment and we have to work in the short term on integrating the, sorry, on integrating the latest Darwin Core standard changes the JBIF team is planning on adding, as well as improve the continuous integration setup. Our ALA extensions added some overhead to the build cycle. This needs to be refined. In addition, there is the potential for further collaboration. Actively maintaining vocabularies for some of the Darwin Core terms has always been on the cards. Currently, both JBIF and ALA are looking at extending the basic occurrence data model. Hence, it makes sense to seek opportunities to work together. To wrap up, by working with JBIF, we managed to substantially improve the occurrence record ingestion system, 
the living atlases community can tap into these benefits in the near future. The ALA can now focus on solving the next challenges in collaboration with JBIP and potentially other biodiversity research infrastructure. I really feel the collaboration with JBIP has been very beneficial. Chances are that, that we might still be working on this project if we didn't have the JBIP team on board. And finally, I'd like to thank all the people that made this project possible. Your contribution is invaluable. And thanks. This is where I stop. Thanks, Javier. That's terrific. Um, and the GBIF collaboration really has been um, a really excellent one over the last little, little while. Um, let me just say there are a couple of questions uh, that have come in. Um, Annie Simpson asks, how long did it take in all to replace the system and how much downtime did you have? Uh, well, the project ran for 15 months. Uh, I'd say data migration, indeed, all the preparation took also uh, months. Uh, but actually, when switching over uh, the systems, it took us, uh, I'd say, like four to five hours downtime. Because uh, prior to that, we, we had most of the system already ready, just doing the latest uh, configurations because, uh, before switching uh, over the identities for our production systems. So a downtime of four to five hours is pretty good for such a huge project. Um, yes. We've also got a question here. I've reused the GBIF Darwin Core Archive IO Java library for years. Assuming that you also reuse the library, when are you planning to distribute this and other ALA GBIF Java libraries through Maven Central, the default way to share open source Java libraries? In other words, what are your plans to promote reuse of your open source libraries? Uh, well, I think, I don't know whether there are two questions there. Just to be more specific, at the moment, we are working only on the GBIF pipelines projects. And that is the only uh, source code that we are sharing with GBIF. Uh, apart from that, we, we have our own set of uh, projects and libraries. All of them are distributed on, on their open source libraries. And indeed, uh, precisely, all the Atlas of Living Australia set up is uh, basically the, the building blocks that provides a, a, well, that are used by the Living Atlases community to spin the different nodes across the, the globe. Very good um, reminder as well that, um, the, that speakers or anyone else can go into the Q&A and provide answers in the Q&A um, if they want to as well. So there can be a, a, an ongoing conversation um, if you would like to. Uh, Javier, afterwards, go in and have another look at that question. Um, sometimes Absolutely. it's difficult to answer things on the fly. Um, but that's it. Kate, can you see any questions anywhere? Oh, no. No, I think, the, I think everybody's been very good about putting their questions in the Q&A. Excellent. That's very good. Um, Javier, thank you very much. We are now running back thank on you. time again. So uh, we might let you uh, relax and hand over now to Erica and Holly. Um, Erica, would you like to start sharing your screen? Uh, so I'll introduce Erica Kimmel and Holly Little, uh, both from the uh, Holly from the Smithsonian and Erica from Florida State University. And they're going to speak, uh, to, they're both going to speak and they will be talking about improving the adoption and evolution of data standards for fossil specimens. Erica, Thanks, Ellie. over to you. I assume that the screen share looks fine. Looks fine, thank you. Great, so like Ellie said, I'm Erica Kremel and I'm here with my colleague today, Holly Little, to present this talk on improving the adoption and evolution of data standards for fossil specimens with a focus on Darwin Core. So there's only three authors listed here, but I do want to acknowledge the contribution to the work we're sharing by many additional people and over a significant period of time. And for an overview of this community effort, um, I direct you, direct you towards our talk at Tadwig, which was presented yesterday and which we'll mention again on my last slide today. Oops. So as standards for sharing specimen data have become more widely adopted, 
it's critical to evaluate their implementation, including how well they serve discipline specific needs. And in particular, fossil specimens often present challenges because they require capturing information that's seemingly parallel to, but not entirely aligned with that of their extant counterparts. Implementation of Darwin core terms can be challenging when trying to, for example, share data about non Linnaean taxonomy or sensitive or restricted localities or quantities of individuals and associations between fossil occurrences. So previous work to evaluate data sharing practices of paleontology collections has shown an imbalance in the use of Darwin core terms. This slide visualizes the implementation of standard terms to fossil occurrences as found in the data available on GBIF grouped by the Darwin core classes labeled on the X axis. The white are terms that do not, or the white areas are terms that don't appear um, at all within the data set. And the colors show frequency of use with red being terms that are most underutilized. To expand on this broad assessment and encourage better adoption of evolving standards and data practices by fossil collections, we really need a more in-depth review of specific term usage. So when we look at the current implementation of Darwin Core for fossil specimens, we see patterns in the term usage as evidenced by analyses like that shown on the previous slide, uh, data, provide, da, data flags applied by aggregators, and discussions within the paleo collections community. Because of the nuances and where these challenges come from, we believe that it's useful to approach them as three broad groups. So this first group consists of terms or classes of terms that are clear to implement but are underutilized or inconsistently used. In many cases, these are terms that neontological disciplines also struggle with. And so a solution for group one type challenges is to better educate data providers. For example, although many paleo collections provide truncated coordinates for specimens with sensitive locality data, a significant portion of them don't make this decision explicit in the occurrence record metadata. So in our example of truncated coordinates for sensitive localities, once data providers are aware of how and when to utilize terms like information withheld or data generalizations, they're, they're really happy to do so. Part of our solution is to increase awareness at the data provider level of existing resources like the georeferencing quick reference guide or sensitive locality guide hosted by GBIF. However, these more general resources aren't always sufficient. So to provide more detailed recommendations for implementing Darwin Core in a paleo context, we're working on several sets of co-created community guidelines, like the snippet shown here, that build on that existing documentation. This act of co-creation is an essential part of our solution to this challenge in challenges in group one, because co-creation engages data providers and builds consensus. So in our discipline specific guidelines for sensitive localities, for example, the paleo collections community had thorough discussions about truncating versus rounding coordinates and about ideal maximum precision. And then understanding that these guidelines are coming from within the paleo collections community engenders trust, even with data providers who weren't directly involved in that co-creation. So in this example, we see that trust prompting some collections to share specimen data that they might not otherwise have made publicly available. While some terms like information withheld and data generalizations are underutilized, we see other terms in our group one type challenge that are just used inconsistently. So formatting conventions and the use of controlled vocabularies can help data providers align their use of standards. And this consistency in the data captured by a term often increases value and discoverability for data users. While the consistency is sometimes applied at a data aggregator level, it's really important for data providers to be aware of their role too. On this slide, we illustrate an example of how the paleo collections community recognized that values in the Darwin core term formation are highly relevant for data discovery by our users. But because major aggregators don't currently index the values in, these, in this field, we, we need to align ourselves. 
So community discussion resulted in a decision to record values a la Dakota formation, that is with a formal lithostratigraphic unit type exclusive of rock type or an abbreviation of the unit. Similarly, in situations where Darwin Core recommends the use of a controlled vocabulary, we see a role for the paleo collections community to evaluate existing options and make recommendations for ourselves. Okay, and so a second group of Darwin Core terms often seem clear to implement, but the terminology used to describe and define them may be unfamiliar to paleontologists, or it may be read as unnecessary for fossil occurrences. This uncertainty about the applicability of a term to paleo data can often result in data not being shared, as seen in the example here, or just leading to confusion, as with generalized terms like recorded by. In these cases, we can make implementation more clear by providing a simple translation of what the definition means in verbiages, verbiage that's familiar to paleontologists or by including paleo-oriented examples in the Darwin Core documentation. So on this slide, we illustrate a group two type challenge that touches the Darwin Core resource relationship class and extension as well as the associated occurrences term, both of which are really underutilized in paleo data. Um, only one and a half percent of fossil specimen records on GBIF use the resource relationship extension, but relationships among fossils are really, really common, as shown by the images on this slide. So one solution that would increase adoption of these terms is to make it clear that they're applicable to fossil specimens by including a paleo-specific example. Uh, and with this, rec with this rationale, our paleo community recommended adding the phrase on slab with as an example to the term relationship of resource during the last Darwin Core review process. Um, vocabularies for relationships commonly found in recent occurrences, like the biotic interaction preserved on the fossilized leaf pictured here. But um, additional work really needs to be done to define the abiotic and more ambiguous relationships that are commonly found between fossil specimens. Our term or our phrase on slab with can refer to an abiotic preservation based relationship. But then we also have man made relationships as seen in the specimen on the lower right where there's some fossil fish and they're mounted with a cast lizard. And this is kind of just the, the beginning of how complicated our, our relationships can be. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Holly. Thanks. So the third group of challenges relates to Darwin Core terms, classes, or extensions that present challenges for adequately representing data in a fossil context. In some cases, usage of these terms is complicated for neontological data as well, but perhaps for different reasons. Although these terms sometimes have the same general use due to the nature of fossil preservation or because a term has a different meaning within the discipline of paleontology, additional layers of uncertainty or ambiguity are present. For example, counting fossils is complicated by their preservation. Next, please. When counting fossils, a single specimen may represent multiple biological organisms as in the image of the scallop with a trilobite on the lower left, or a single organism may be separated between multiple specimens, as in the image shown in the top left, or it may be impossible to determine from the fossil record whether or not a specimen represents a single or many organisms, as with the fern or the bones pictured in the lower right. Group two challenges require active involvement from the paleo community in the standards development and review process to ensure the information for these occurrences and the meaning in that data are clear. For example, during the recent Darwin Core review, again, a suggested change to the definition of individual count would have made this term incompatible with the type of data that paleo collections share here. These issues are complicated to resolve, but the problems are not intractable and the opportunities for better data mobilization are important. Next, please. While we're able to sort some terms and topics into those three groups as described, there are also topics that present more complexity and require solutions that can range from initial, sometimes short-term changes to a need 
to a need for more in-depth discussion and development of new strategies. Taxonomic information is a great example of this, especially for paleo data. Challenges stem from a variety of sources like open nomenclature, wide range of uncertainty, lack of higher classification details, common use of ranks that have no equivalent terms in the standard, or needed improvements to the taxonomic backbones that align to fossil taxa. In some instances, increased use of terms like taxon rank or higher classification can improve ingestion and discovery of this information, but for sustainable lasting improvements, strategic infrastructure and data standards development is needed to better meet the needs of fossil occurrence data. Next. While discussing the implementation challenges you've seen here, it's important to include ideas for how we can actually move towards our goals of improving the adoption and evolution of data standards. We see community knowledge management as a separate but intrinsically related challenge, and we know that many others at this meeting are also aware of just how challenging it can be. This schematic outlines the approach we are taking where work is occurring in parallel channels, and one of our group's goals is to ensure this work is complementary and can lead to tangible outputs like dynamic community resources and published community created guidelines. Next. We can all agree that in today's world, digitally accessible data is essential for science. This is as true for paleontologists as neontologists. And to this extent, paleo collections have published close to 12 million fossil occurrence records on GBIF. We know that these data exponentially increase the information available to researchers, as exemplified by this figure from a 2018 publication that found a 23-fold increase in digitally available Cenozoic marine invertebrate site data from museum collections on the right, as compared to the liter literature on the left. Next. All of this work on data standards and especially on their implementation has a direct impact on how useful the data are to research. While data providers work to generate and mobilize more and better data, it's important to also ensure that discovery of that data is enabled throughout our global data ecosystem. We believe that a discipline focused approach to understanding the implementation of data standards like Darwin Core at the term level helps to increase knowledge sharing across the paleo community. It improves data quality and standards adoption, moves these data sets towards alignment with best practices like the FAIR data principles, and is important for informing the broader standards development process. We also believe that improving the mobilization and discovery of biodiversity data is a shared responsibility for which standards organizations data providers and data aggregators all have a role to play. Next. And with that, we'll say thank you and have a list of resources here um, relevant to this discussion. And uh, we'd also like to point you to the Tadwig Earth Sciences and Paleobiology Interest Group session that will be held in November, where we hope to discuss some of these challenges more. And I think Talia put some of these links into the chat while we were talking. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Erica. Um, that was terrific. Um, and Talia, thanks. I did see things going back into the chat. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment, so I can ask one. Um, and the question that um, occurred to me is, particularly when you were talking about standardising uh, standardizing terms like how to refer to the Dakota Formation, for example, um, is the is the tell me a little bit about the paleo community. Is it small enough and cohesive enough that you can have those sorts of discussions to get agreement on how those how those terms should look and how? Because um, I think for some other some other communities, um, some people listening who are maybe belonging to uh, different communities um, of uh, science, uh, bi biodiversity research, might be thinking, "Oh, wow! What do you mean the paleo people can just sit down and talk about it and get an agreement?" 
I think we can start small and expand out <laughs> because we do have a very strong core group. And part of that other talk that we mentioned that we gave yesterday gives a little bit of a history behind that and how long they've been working together to do some of this work. Many of them are on the call and they're welcome to jump in if they'd like. Um, but yeah, I think we can start small. And if we show the proof of concept, right, then hopefully more people will adopt. Erica, did you want to? Say anything? Holly put it well, but there are fewer <laughs> paleo collections than some other disciplines. So that's a benefit in this case. Kate, anything else that you can see to pass through to Holly and so Erica? We, we did have a question come in from uh, Deb Paul. She asked, how can we share this model and, and enable other communities to do the same work in parallel? I, I'll take a stab at that. I think it's a really big capacity issue, a human capacity issue, because, and again, I'll refer to our other talk, but maintaining the um, human and social structures that have allowed us to review our use of terms in these ways is not a small feat and has taken a lot of people a lot of time. So especially for disciplines that are less tight knit as the paleo than the paleo community, um, it might be even more difficult because your your working relationships are even more dispersed and you it takes all that more effort to get together and get aligned on things. That's great. So um, as, as has been mentioned, there's another talk that you can go back and have a look at the video for it. Uh, there's also the dis continuing discussion that will happen, uh, which will be the uh, Earth Sciences and Paleobiology Interest Group meeting. Uh, which will happen during the working group sessions in November, and that one's scheduled for November the 4th. So if you're interested, please come along to that one uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Okay, thank you. I, I think now we should move on to introduce uh, Katie next. Uh, Katie Pearson is a project manager at the California Polytechnic State University, uh, who's also going to be talking uh, about data standards, and her talk relates not to pilot, not to paleontology, but to phenology of plant specimens. So Katie, I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, like was said, my name is Katie Pearson. I'm, a, I'm at the California Polytechnic State University in California in, in the United States. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you all about some recent developments in the creation of data standards for plant phenology. So I'm the project manager for a statewide herbarium digitization project called the California Phenology Network. And this collaboration has created not only thousands of images and occurrence records for herbarium specimens, but it has also produced phenological data as well, which is data on the flowering or fruiting status of the digitized specimens. And as part of this project, we developed a set of phenological data standards for scoring the phenological status of herbarium specimens. Uh, but we understand that phenology is an issue of much broader interest than to just the herbarium community. So we, in turn, have started thinking a little bit more broadly as well. So speaking of thinking a little more broadly, I want to briefly zoom out and explain the deeper motivation behind all of this, which is phenology. And phenology is the study of the timing of life history events, such as flowering or fruiting for angiosperms. And the timing of plant phenological events can impact not only the fitness of the plants themselves, but also the entire community that interacts with that plant, such as communities of pollinators, uh, herbivores, and uh, directly and indirectly, the success of these plants and the communities then affect human thriving through, for example, agriculture, silviculture, forestry, etc. So studying the timing of these phenological events uh, and how they shift with changes in climate and land use is vital for understanding the effects of these changes on our natural world. So groups all over the world have recognized the importance of phenology and phenological observation networks, uh, phenological surveys, and efforts to extract phenological data from biodiversity specimens have really arisen across the globe. Like this slide just has a few examples of the international um, collaborations that are going on looking at phenological data. 
And so these have produced really mountains of phenological data to date in lots of different formats. So these phenological data collection efforts often record these data using different scales and metrics, such as the BBCH scale, which is shown there on the right, and then uh, the scoring schema developed by the US National Phenology Network, shown on the left. And among these are efforts to score phenological status from herbarium specimens. And during this process, researchers often select different schemas by which to categorize reproductive conditions. So presence versus absence, percentages, counts, things like that. So there are many ways to represent phenological traits for plants, and they may not always well integrate with one another. Furthermore, phenological data are not expressly treated in the Darwin core. And they have been variously stored in Darwin core fields, uh, occurrence remarks, reproductive condition, verbatim attributes, and others, making phenological data difficult to aggregate, access, and analyze at scale across data sources. So on the right here, you can't see it very well, but uh, it's just a snapshot of the data from the reproductive condi condition field in our own database of California herbarium specimens. And it already shows a plethora of over, often overlapping terms for phenological traits. So there are many places to store phenological data and many ways of recording it, but no easy way to map these across institutions, much less across organizations that you're using different phenological scoring protocols. So a few years ago, a group of uh, biodiversity informaticists and people interested in phenology made some great strides forward uh, toward the integration of data sets by developing a plant phenology ontology. And this has the potential to connect data sets using a standardized relational vocabulary, but this ontology still needs further development and uh, broader adoption. Okay, so reeling back to our digitization network and herbarium specimens. So in the California Phenology Network, uh, we use terms defined in the plant phenology ontology, and we share them via the measurement or fact extension in the Darwin core. So in practice, this looks like a measurement or fact file downloaded as part of a Darwin core archive, and the fields have been populated from a controlled vocabulary and the ID field, so uh, measurement type ID, for example, contain links to the plant phenology ontology. So this is a start and we opted for the measurement or fact extension in our case, because it has the ability to store metadata about the scoring schema and protocol. So who scored it, when did they score it? But if we had elected to just use a single Darwin core, Darwin core field like re reproductive condition, we would not have been able to record who determined the phenological status, uh, which does vary across phenological data collecting initiatives, as I previously mentioned. However, the measurement or fact extension has its own drawbacks. And uh, because it's a separate file downloaded along with the main occurrences file, measurement or fact files can be often confusing and at worst kind of invisible to researchers. So uh, that's a major drawback or challenge for dealing with these types of data. And in both of these methods, if we were to store via a single Darwin core field or through um, the measurement or fact file, a formalized and standardized vocabulary has not been developed. So there's little guidance for integrating disparate data sets beyond the developing plant phenology ontology. So these standards are really important because we want to be able to integrate phenological data sets and thus understand uh, phenological shifts across broader reaches of time and space. So in this example, we have two projects that collected phenological data from herbarium specimens and in very similar ways, but still quite not perfectly aligned. So we want to know how to join these together and look at taxa, in this case, across the United States, rather than just in our silos of data. Another important use case is sharing phenological data across initiatives with radically different data collection methods. So like uh, protocols relying on visual inspection by humans versus protocols that utilize machine learning algorithms to score phenological traits, because both are uh, widely used 
Um, a lot of researchers are, you know, recruiting undergraduates and grad students and citizen scientists to do visual inspection, but there's been a lot of progress made on machine learning models that can uh, very rapidly score phenological status. So we want to be able to integrate these types of data sets as well. So all of this has motivated the formation of a new TADWIG plant phenology task group. And our broad goal is to improve the accessibility and interoperability of phenological trait data from plant occurrences. And we want to really empower phenological research at greater scales and across different phenological monitoring initiatives to maximize the effect of all of our collective effort. So exactly how we're going to develop these standards or rather what they're gonna look like is still in discussion. And so uh, some options are we can continue to rely on the measurement or fact extension and just develop a standardized vocabulary for it. We could propose new fields for the Darwin core. We could develop a phenology specific extension for the Darwin core. But again, we're not exactly sure what this is going to look like and that's why uh, that's what we hope to determine. And that's also why I'm here today to um, ask you for help. So we're assembling a cross-disciplinary team who are interested in furthering the development of standards for plant phenology. And we would love more input from the global phenology and data standards community. So if you're interested in all, at all, we would love to have you. So we were just approved as a TADWIG task group this week, like literally one or two days ago, and our charter can now be found on our extremely sparse GitHub page. Um, and we invite you to check it out and uh, look a little bit more about what we're interested in doing. And if you're interested in joining our task group or uh, providing comments on the standards as they are developed, or just keeping abreast of these developments, please email our working group conveners, which should be Dr. Jen Yost and myself to get involved. So uh, thanks for your attention and we look forward to hearing from some of you about involvement in this initiative. Thanks, Katie. What a what a really interesting thing. So so as a as a zoologist, um, I'm still constantly learning about the types of information that you can get out of other types of um, other types of collections, and uh, it had never occurred to me that you could get phenological data out of herbarium specimens. So there you go. I've learned something today, and as I do every day, which is um, that's uh, that's really interesting. Um, now we don't have any questions. I don't. Oh no, we do. No, we've got three questions. Sorry. Um, uh, so the, the one at the top, the one pinned at the top, uh, is from Deb Paul. Uh, that's, from, that's from the last talk. I'd copied it over from the chat. Uh, okay. Sorry. So it's the two, right. two below that. Two below that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the first one is from Arthur, Arthur Chapman in Australia. He writes, are you aware of the phenology tags in iNaturalist? At the moment, just flowering, fruiting, flower budding, no evidence of flowering. These aren't always used, but are in some projects, such as the Hakia invasives. It would be good to be consistent in terminology with what you are developing. Absolutely, Arthur. That is one of the huge observational data sets that we'd love to be able to integrate. And uh, that's a mostly human observation, visual observation, but that still counts as a plant occurrence. So, yes. And the second, uh, another question here is, um, do, have you tried the OBUS extended measurement or FACT um, data format? In, in the Brazilian network on plant pollinator interactions, we have adopted extended measurement or FACT to share standardized traits measurement from, plant, from a plant pollinator vocabulary. I don't think so, but I will look into it. And you might want to um, get in contact directly with Jose, who um, uh, maybe you two could talk together. Uh, Abby Benson writes, the OBUS community also use, oh, so extend it on that as well. Uh, the OBUS community also uses the measurement or fact extension to document information. Uh, Abby's wondering if there might be opportunities for us to learn from each other. Absolutely. <laughs> yep, that's an easy, easy one to answer. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so that's the, they're the only, they're the questions that have come in so far. Kate, have you seen anything else? Nope, not seeing anything. I like the, there is a question in the chat that says, can anyone provide the link to the phenology Tadwig group? So uh, if somebody has a chance to provide that, that would be super. Um, we did, she got two for one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we've got, we've got a few minutes to have a, a, a bit of an open discussion. Um, and so I'd invite uh, anyone who would like to, to come off mute and participate in the discussion. I think the, uh, the observation that I would make from the talks that we've heard today is that uh, there are several, um, several talks mentioned using machine learning techniques, which are, which are terrific, which is um, really interesting. Several talks uh, spoke about how the need to squash data in, in where it doesn't really fit um, and the need for, uh, so which then prompts, do we actually need an extension for this type of data? Um, there's also, uh, there was also something else that came to mind, which was, um, so you're squashing data in, um, then having to form your own controlled vocabularies, which might not match the controlled vocabularies also in use in that particular term. Uh, or the free text that's in use in that particular term within Darwin Core. And then on the other side, we've got, then got the issue of how to allow users to actually, uh, how, how, to use it, how, do, how do users then find the data? How do they query the data? Sometimes the data is not um, available, uh, for, sorry, the fields aren't available within the front end of the aggregators to be able to even allow you to search on the, day, on the fields that you're interested in, um, which, ties in for me into uh, one of the points that Alice made in the opening plenary about um, we need to know what people need to ask. Um, so she was talking in a, in a policy sense that um, we need to know what the policy makers want to ask in order to be able to provide that to them. In some, some ways, this seems like it's a similar thing. Uh, if the paleo community can't actually search on the fields that make sense to them, then they can't ask the questions that are important to them. So that's really just a, a discussion prompt. It's not so much a question as a discussion prompt. And I wonder if anyone would like to um, share any thoughts. No need to all speak at once. I can make one quick comment on the data accessibility discovery part. Um, the, the issue that we have with the paleo data and geologic context terms not being indexed actually really does greatly impact on how that information is used because most of the researchers in our discipline are going to other sources. And that's where you, when you see that 23 fold increase in the literature versus the collections data, most of the resources they're going to are databases that are based on the literature. And so they're not, because they can't search based on those geologic context terms and also the locality or site data is in bit another big one, um, they're not using our collections data. So it's a combined effort to try to get there. I can see quite a few names who I'm sure have opinions on these things. So I might just um, put a few people on the spot. Um, James Macklin, have you got any thoughts? Ha, huh, you caught me eating, but yes, I always have <laughs> thoughts. I won't put my camera on. Well, I mean, it, you know, we're talking about discovery, right? And, and access and, and I think research use, I mean, how do researchers know that our resource is there? How do they know what the quality of that resource is? Uh, and th these are big questions, right? And, and we have to be able to present to that audience why. Uh, that there's a big why there. And why doesn't necessarily come directly from that resource, the aggregator, et cetera. It comes through networking. It comes from going to those domains, to those communities, sharing the information like you just did, uh, Holly, 
and saying to them, hey, there's value here, and this is why you should see that value, and this is how you can help us uh, improve that quality. And so I, I think that, you know, that engagement in order to sort of validate the use of all this great work that we're doing, uh, we, we want those people to come, we want them to have the evidence on hand to do the research that they do at, at a high quality. I totally agree. And I think it's a good combined effort between all those parties. And I think Talia is going to add. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, let me put my hand down. Um, yeah, I was just going to say for the paleo community too, there's also some, I think, social issues with using GBIF. So paleobiology database has been around for decades and people are used to using it. They're, they understand, you know, how, where the data come from. It's a literature-based data source. And all of a sudden we're asking them to use something else that they don't understand. And it's not built for them. It's not you know, they feel like it's not for them. And so um, I think that's another really big hurdle we're gonna have to overcome. You know, we spent the last decade digitizing our fossil collections and making them available. And now how do we get people to use this new data source? Katie, where's, where's the phenology community looking at the moment? Um, is there something similar uh, for that community that uh, they're looking, instead of looking to, to GBIF to, provide, to uh, set, search for the information? Yeah, I was just about to comment. It always, um, I don't know, grieves me or makes me laugh when I read a phenology paper that says, we went to this herbarium and scored this many specimens. And I understand that not all herbaria are digitized, so that does make sense in certain you know, regions and processes. But there are still millions of herbarium specimen images out there that you can access. Um, and I think that this, due to some kind of a proliferation of papers in the past like 10 years, people are starting to look to um, herbarium specimens for phenological data. But then um, concurrently, there are all these really big observational projects going on like the National Phenology Network. And so we're kind of like rediscovering this historical record of herbarium specimens, which is uniquely old. And then we have all these great new phenological observation um, networks. And we're still just trying to figure out how you mesh those together because we're kind of just playing with our big data sets like apart from each other. Thank you. Uh, Gil, you've got your hand up. Would you like to come off mute and make a comment? Yeah, I have a, I guess it's a question for all of the last speakers. <laughs> um, Holly, Erica, Katie, and Talia, regarding the standards for your particular interest area. Sounds like you, your commonality is that you're struggling with a Darwin core format that might not fit what you need. And you're trying to, it sounded like what Erica was saying was from the paleo group, is you're going to build your own uh, and build your own vocabularies. Um, and, I, and it sounds like that's kind of what the phonology group is trying to work on too. And I'm wondering, do you feel like the, your data can be folded into a Darwin core type standard or are you going to have to be sort of separate from that? I'll take a, a first comment at this, but I'm sure others have more opinions. It, you know, it's really important, and we think about this a lot, to recognize how much work our community has already put into developing the standards that we have. And so I think that the, the like initial reaction in academia is often like, I have this idea, I'm going to go solve it without doing the due diligence to see who's already done the work to try and solve it. And so for the paleo working group, it's not so much that we don't see Darwin Core as being, you know, fit for our needs. It's that we haven't put the time in as a community to figuring that out. And so we're just doing that now. And, you know, I heard some of this with Dave's talk too, when, when he was asked about, you know, are you using the ISO standard for, for your um, integrated with the iSample standard? And it's, maybe some of the same kind of thing. We're like, yeah, we're evaluating it, but there are certain things that we'll need to like tweak. So 
there's a provenance in terms of how much work other people have put into where things are now, and then what of that you can take and move forward to fit, you know, specific needs. Thanks, Erica. Um, we don't have any other hands up, but um, Dave, I'd quite, I'd, or that I can see anyway, please yell out if, um, if I'm missing something. Um, I'll jump in, but please ask Dave. Please, I'll, I'll jump in later if you don't. It's done. Okay, I was going to slightly take, take it off into a different direction because I was going to, I'm really interested in uh, the term mapping, Dave, um, that using uh, ML to, uh, using the fast text algorithm that you mentioned, uh, that's now, and so you've now got to the point where you can, you've got automated mapping of all the terms um, and the phenological community are also using ML. So I was just uh, interested in, um, uh, do you think that this is something that the community, we're, we're struggling, for example, with preparation type, um, so is, and which is related to material sample. Um, is it something that we, you think we should be trying to roll out more widely into the community, I suppose? Um, yeah, I think there's great opportunity for any any of this work where we're basically taking you know, some sort of organically generated information, be it free text or an image or, or something else, and trying to just um, you know, extract information, consistent types of information from that. And that's that's something that machine learning is very, you know, it's what it does. It's you know, it's designed to do. Um, there are, of course, a plethora of different algorithms that can be used and leveraged, and you know, it's a, it's, it's a, <laughs> it's a topic that's you know a lifetime of research in itself. So, the the challenge from my perspective is really just um, figuring out which pieces are going to be useful right away, without having to spend you know a couple of years of research trying to figure it all out and so forth. So I think there's great opportunity for. Um, now, any any of the larger conferences that we go to, there's always machine learning um, presentations and topics there. I think uh, you know it's a it's a great opportunity for networking and this discussion across different domains. Uh, just <laughs> I just encourage everybody to discuss the challenges that they have, and there may or may not be a solution that's already out there or can easily be tweaked. So uh, it's yeah, it's a fascinating field, and I think there's still a huge opportunity to take advantage of. And Katie, you're having success with machine learning as well? Yeah, there are several groups. Um, some of them who have presented at this conference, I don't think they presented about phenology, but they did, um, I think, plant identification. So if you look at uh, Pierre uh, Bonnet's work and also uh, Hervé Guo, um, they've done some phenological um, work. So we, they, we've been throwing them a bunch of images and there are all sorts of ways that we can decide whether they are reproductive. And now we're trying to identify actual reproductive structures on the pages. So um, there's tons of synergy in this, this particular realm though, because a lot of people are doing image, um, you know, mapping, like trying to find specific things on images. So a lot of people are doing image categorization and just trait measurements off of things like herbarium specimens. So yeah, definite synergy throughout the whole biodiversity community, I would say. That's great. Now I think um, I've got, I have one more question, but I think we've run out of time to ask it, but I'll just put it out there, which was, I was going to, I know there's a few Atlas of Living Australia people on the call. Um, I haven't seen whether there's very many GBIF people. Um, but I was going to, to just uh, reflect on that, uh, the comment about um, not having the right fields to query on and wondering for those uh, people who are running running the, the places where people, where you want people to come and query, uh, what, are the, what are the challenges involved with um, providing the most flexible, uh, the flexible query interface that you can. Um, Javier, I don't know with, one minute if you would like to make any comment or if anyone else would, but um, on that. Sure, uh, I think a short answer, I think uh, there is no one size fits all. Uh, that would be my take on that. 
And as we talk about that, uh, as we are trying to tackle the, what we call in the ALA, the extended data model, precisely a uh, part of that uh, take is understanding what is the best way to present uh, this new information for users. So can we uh, uh, continue using the interface that we have? Do we have to develop something new? Do we need to engage with uh, experts like a uh, UX experts uh, to guide us in what would be the most sensible way to, to make that information available or, well, or to make it easier for users to query that data. So I think uh, those are the challenges or uh, some of the aspects I can see uh, around uh, precisely that. That's great, thanks. Um, Deb, did you want to jump in as the very last word or are you happy to continue the conversation in chat? Oh, thanks. Boy, you're spoiling me. Uh, to everybody, I would say that all of this, the communication we've just seen, um, Talia, Holly, and Erica, um, Katie, they are these key examples of these communication strategies we need um, across and between and in communities. Uh, showing us models, getting engaged in the Tadwig process, bringing that to other communities, the evaluation of data, help the kind of things that Holly, Erica, and Talia have done, uh, the data visualization they've been part of to help the community understand where their power lies to improve that data and to understand it, and to get engaged with us so that we can help with the standards where there may be gaps or misunderstandings, et cetera, and the kind of things that James pointed out when you asked him, that this, do we, we need more staff? Sure. More people who play this role? Yes. Um, in, in order for people to to be engaged in this process and add their their knowledge to the pile. Um, thanks for that. That's <laughs> Thank great. You, okay. Thank you, everybody. We're a couple of minutes over time, so we should wrap up now. Uh, a little advertisement for um, the next session, which is the pub quiz, uh, which Kimberly Cook is running. Uh, please join in that if you uh, are at the end of your day and feel like having a little bit of fun um, or in fact at any time of your day and would like to just have some social, social time with the other attendees of the conference. Uh, th I'd like to thank all of our speakers for today. Um, thanks to Kate Ingenloff for uh, helping co-moderate and asking the questions, very much appreciated. Um, so I will bid you farewell. Uh, thank you for a great session. Um, I certainly learned some things and found it really enjoyable. So. Have a good uh, day, afternoon, evening or night time. Thanks very much. <laughs>